So let me welcome everybody to today's serious security seminar. And this is a special treat this week. Uh, we have someone who has two degrees from Purdue, who is uh, going to be our speaker today, but also has a really interesting set of, um, I guess we'll call them certifications, but degrees, uh, accomplishments. Uh, she not only is a professional engineer, uh, and, and PE means she has passed the professional engineering exam with a patent in an engineering area. She has a PhD in computer science and a law degree. She's a licensed lawyer uh, and is also registered with uh, the US Patent Office. Uh, with all of that, she is a professor at Texas A&M teaching both in law and in cybersecurity. It's an incredible collection of accomplishments with expertise that spans a number of areas that we're deeply concerned with. And that's actually the topic of her talk. She's going to be talking about the need for legal education within a cybersecurity curriculum. So I welcome Paula DeWitt to our security seminar, and we're all really excited to hear what you have to say today. Thank you for coming. Take it away. All right, thank you so much. Those are very kind words for you to say, and I hope I can live up to your expectations. Um, as he said, I have this alphabet soup after my name, so let me, let me talk about that a little bit as my slide will move forward. You will notice, by the way, on this slide that Purdue trumps everything else, all right? because I got my start at Purdue and I love Purdue. I was a girl off a farm in Indiana, first gen to go to college, the four of five daughters. My parents said, you got two career choices, be a nurse or be a teacher. My math SAT scores were off the chart. So at that time, the people would say, you're gonna make a great math teacher. Uh, I lasted a math for about one year. <laughs> and at that time there was a window of opportunity to get into programming if you didn't have a degree. My degree at Purdue was not in computer science. In 2015, I was honored to be a distinguished alum of the mathematics department in the uh, School of Science. And uh, I can't remember the guy's name, but he from Red Hat, the chief technical officer, was uh, the computer science person in the School of Science. And his acceptance was right before mine. And he stood up and started talking about what computer science, being a student in computer science in the 70s was like. And so I altered my speech. And when I got up, I said, I want to remind this gentleman, whatever his name was, why I wasn't a computer science major. Now I look at how you guys study computer science and engineering. And my gosh, you live in heaven compared to the kind of infrastructure we had, which would lead me to another point, not a point of this topic. But, but you know, why don't we have more women? But we'll, we'll leave that one. I do have a PhD from Texas A&M University. Circumstances brought me here. Uh, I worked as a software engineer in various roles. I started my own business when I was getting my PhD. I ran a business in Austin for four years for uh, Israeli, uh, the, at that time, the biggest Israeli uh, software conglomerate. Uh, I've done research, as uh, Spaff said, I have a patent uh, from one of my startups that I got six or seven years ago. Uh, I am still a licensed attorney, although I don't practice that much. Uh, I became a registered professional engineer probably for the worst reason. I became one because I was in Austin High Tech for a little less than a decade. And I got tired of people saying software engineers aren't real engineers. So now I went through all the hoops to get the soft to be registered professional engineer in the state of Texas. And, you know, I'm a little bit flippant sometimes, but when people say software engineers aren't real engineer, I just pull out my card from Texas and say, well, you can argue with the state of Texas because they say I'm a professional engineer. There's not a big need for them uh, as it would be for civil engineers. We're a very small part of the engineering community. And several years ago, I was working with a Norwegian client helping write patents and their uh, attorney said, I was uh, very good at writing claims. And he suggested I, I get my patent license, which I did. I practiced patent law for a short period of time. I came to AM and I had a tragedy when my partner that I was working with on patent law suddenly passed away. So I've poured all my energy into AM. Uh, I teach cybersecurity law and I teach cybersecurity risk. And with my role in the law school about two years ago, I developed a plan for them 
for their non-law masters, their masters of jurisprudence, you're not, you're not required to be a lawyer like you would with an LLM program. And I developed a cybersecurity management track because I saw in my work with industry, I had just finished a training with a large aerospace company in Fort Worth that, you know, we concentrate a lot on the technical aspects of cybersecurity, but there's this large community of people who have to work with us or talk to us or manage projects. And they implemented that plan. They forgot to tell me until about a year later and that program's up and running. So I'm, I've got my, uh, got my fingers in a lot of pies at a and and, you know, people don't like lawyers, you know, lawyers are, when do we see lawyers? We see lawyers when something bad's happened. We're being sued. We have to sue, you know, family dispute. Um, and, I, and, and in full disclosure, neither of my children liked math or science. I think there was a mix up in the nursery when they were born. And both of them are very uh, successful lawyers in Houston. So my, my talk today is why are we including law in a cybersecurity curriculum? And I, I, I want this, I'm very passionate about this topic and here's why, here's my observation. First of all, there's a pragmatic reason. Pragmatically, I see, and I'm, I'm speaking from Texas A&M, okay? I'm speaking from what I see at Texas A&M. We have some constraints here. We have a law that you have to be able to get a bachelor's degree in 120 hours, okay? So that really crams a lot. But what I see is that we don't adequately prepare our students in the non-technical skills. We send our students out in engineering and computer science. Computer science at AM is in the College of Engineering, not in the College of Science. And they're going to, and I saw this in Austin, I saw very smart technical people being taken advantage of because they didn't know the basics of law. They didn't know contract law. They signed employment agreements. They would be told something and they believed it to be true, which wasn't true. They didn't know how to protect intellectual property or who owned what. Now that's not the basis of my talk. That's just another need we have. I'm gonna focus this talk on why it is extremely important to teach law and cybersecurity curriculum. And I want you to think about this. I put this in the abstract for the talk that every time you put your hands on the keyboard, you don't even have to be a cyber worker. You could be a civil engineer. You can be doing software development. You don't want anything to do with cybersecurity, but you're interacting in that world. And every time you put your hands on the keyboard, you're operating in a very uncertain legal and ethical framework. And you can, you know, the classic example I use in my classes, I can be in Houston, Texas, and I have clients that, uh, you know, I don't know are European citizens and their data is being processed and, you're, and I'm doing something for them and I'm under uh, an EU law. Um, and not only that, more and more people in workers, whatever you're doing, you're seeing privacy data. They're under different legal regimes. You're seeing intellectual property, you're getting burdened, but yet we don't adequately prepare people for this. So I came to Texas A&M uh, four years ago, July of 2017, and I developed two classes, one cybersecurity law and policy and the other cybersecurity risk. I teach this class differently than even the, the fellow whose textbook I use. I teach this class, I don't wanna make you lawyers, okay? We, the world's got enough lawyers. I wanna make you legal savvy tech workers in whatever vocation, career, job that you have. I wanna build in my students the ability to develop a legal analysis framework. How I teach this class today is so different than how I taught it three years ago why things change. And it's going to be different when I my students graduate and they go out and take jobs and in five years. So instead of uh, we teach the basics of law and the understanding of the current laws, but one of my overarching goals is if you're hit in a situation, do you know how to analyze that? Do you know where you would go to look for answers? Do you know when you have to raise your hand and say, I think we need legal counsel for this, right? So it's been an exciting experience that I wanna share with you. So that's the pragmatic reason, right? That we don't prepare our students as much as we should. But I actually did a little work and I don't represent NIST, but I wanted to talk about this work from their NIST NICE framework, National Initiative in Cybersecurity Education. And when I first developed my law and policy class, I went through the NIST NICE framework. <clears throat> and 
we tend to think, you know, whatever our job's going to be, like everybody I know in cyber here, the really good software engineers, and not everybody, but a lot of them want to be pen testers, right? Or they want to do this. They want to be threat analyst or something. Um, and I and I, I don't know if you're familiar with the NISTOIS framework. It starts with 50, seven big categories, then 52 work roles, and some specialty areas. And it is detailed beyond comprehension almost. And it has... 630 knowledge descriptions. And I'll show you some in a few minutes. The knowledge, this, and this, and this. And then it defines each work role and the different tasks. So you have all these mappings of this work role over these kind of tasks, but maybe this work role has some of those tasks and the like. Develops into skills. I think I'm, I'm hearing from this, they're gonna drop the abilities. So I went through this rigorously and I'll tell you how in a minute and then I found out that there were only one or two of these work roles that required a law degree. And the reason it's one or two is because one of them definitely asks us the cyber legal advisor gives legal advice. And when you say gives legal advice, you're, you're talking about you need a lawyer. The other is a privacy officer, which could be a lawyer, but doesn't have to be. So that's why there's only one or two. So out of these 52 work roles, only one requires a law degree. But yet when I analyzed the data, I did a manual search on all of these terms. And, and keep in mind, first of all, I'm doing this manually and I'm writing it down on notebook paper. So I could have made a mistake, right? Maybe I missed a term. I, I come up with all the words I could come up with, legal, law, privacy, counsel, regulation, executive order, right? And I find out that while it seems like a small number of tasks out of the 100,007 rather, and maybe a small number statistically, the knowledge descriptions, that when you look at these mappings, there are the, the need for law and regulations knowledge is actually in every work role. Because if you're familiar with this nice framework, the first six is in uh, every work role. And one of it is knowledge of laws and regulations. The other, by the way, another one is knowledge of cybersecurity risk. So I've got both classes covered. In every work role, there's a minimum amount of legal knowledge that you need. So I took this. So let me give you two examples. This is uh, the work role of system architecture and develops system concepts, works on the capability, da, 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 and then translates technology and environmental conditions, and then in parentheses, e.g. the law and regulation into system and security designs and processes. So if you wanna be a system architect and you go through the work role and you look through the knowledge and the skills and you've got the abilities and you understand the task, you have to know some level of law and regulations. And you have to ask yourself, how am I going to incorporate these into system designs and processes? How am I going to know that I'm compliant? What is going to be my liability or the liability that I put my company in if I don't do this correctly? And I want you to, th and, and I've, what I've learned every time I teach this class, every semester, I teach it different. Um, one of the uh, insights I had this year was that I can take the laws that I teach and some of them affect, would affect you individually. I'm going into this this week, just about the time the classes, you know, people are listening to me and they're starting to get a little overwhelmed with the laws. And then I say, if you're ever going to go to federal prison, it's going to be you violated one of these two laws, you as an individual, right? Because they're federal laws. And I always tell the story of Aaron Schwartz, who was tried under, or who was going to be tried under the CFAA. Um, uh, and, and I usually do not give my personal opinion when I teach, but in that case, I say it's clear prosecutorial overreach. Prosecutor overreach was, was insane that drove this young man to commit suicide. Um, <clears throat> so the first category of laws is, what are those that you could be liable for? You could have civil, which means lawsuits with your personal liability or criminal implications. The second class of laws are those laws that you could be working for a company or an entity and create liability for them. 
And the third set are laws that I don't look at at that much depth in the class because there's so many of them, but this is putting restrictions on the government, the government's ability to get to data. I go over these because everyone needs to know these. They're in addition to your rights that are protected by your first, fourth, fifth, and sixth, and 14 amendments. Uh, but there's three ways to look at the law. So, you know, going back to this, um, one of these laws, or one of these knowledge of those laws, is in something that a lot of people wouldn't think about being a system architect. You know, think of what you need to know technically to do that. But is there a requirement to kind of look at this and say, wait a minute, what laws and regulations do I need to know? And how am I going to trace it? I think it would be a fascinating course, and I don't know how to do it. If you took a lot of these compliance issues and say, can I actually trace them to where they're, I can see that they are incorporated in the software I'm developing or the hardware I'm developing if you're not a software person. Uh, I did a training session for mid-career software engineers and compliance people at a large aerospace company in Fort Worth, Texas a couple of summers ago. And uh, the compliance person that was head of compliance. So you had very two diverse groups. You had software engineers who knew a lot of this basics, but they didn't know how to do cybersecurity because they had been, you know, out of school 20 some years. And then you had these compliance people that didn't know how to do software, but they knew all the compliance issues. And they gave me a list of all the compliance regulations that drove them. And it was like 200 different, either laws, regulations, executive orders, industry standards, whatever was governing their product, going to the DOD, you know, and, and it was just overwhelming. And that's why I got the idea. How could you even take this and know that you are properly incorporating this into the final product? Okay. Another one that comes up is the threat analysis. So you want to be a threat analyst, right? Well, guess what? One of the uh, uh, the work role definition that defined by NIST is you have to be able to help initialize or support law enforcement. Well, this is a fascinating conversation we could have, right? Are you acting for an agent of the government? Because if you are, you can't, you have to get Fourth Amendment compliant warrants. And I always love it on TV where, you know, you see these cop shows and the, the policeman says, oh, I'll go get a warrant for the judge. And it's like you go to a vending machine, pop out warrant what you need and hit the button. And that's not the way it works. You know, there's four elements of the Fourth Amendment, um, one of which is by oath or affirmation. Was there probable cause? Are you going to particularly describe this? You know, the right to protect people and their persons and their effects and their houses. What I love about American history and the law is that these amendments were written in 1789. And so part of our challenge is how do you interpret the constitution in a digital and virtual world? How do you interpret a fifth amendment right, let's say, against self-incrimination, which does that mean I gotta give you my password to my computer or cell phone? And if, and some courts will say, that's protected by your fifth amendment right, no. Others will say that's not. They use different court analogies. Uh, one court said, if it's biometric, it's if your fingerprint, you have no protection. So, okay, I'm confused. It's that old legal thing. It depends, right? It depends on a lot of factors. So when you look at, let's say, go back to threat analysis, how is evidence bagged and tagged? You know, if you're, you know, that's, that's the, the word uh, one of my friends that's a CISO always used that came from NSA. At a, he's a CISO now at a larger um, oil and gas uh, communications company and you know how do you how do you provide that chain of custody where in your classwork an undergraduate or graduate has that process ever been defined and then what evidence can you legally gather without a search warrant because the fourth amendment prohibits the government requires the government to have a fourth amendment compliant search warrant but also agents of the government so I work for a, a public entity, as is Purdue. Uh, if I did anything, I'm actually acting, I could be construed as being an agent of the government, 
right? If, if my, my fellow friends that teach at Rice University, it's a private university. They can, they can get away with things we couldn't get by with, right? So I love this when I teach my students because it's a little bit eye-opening. Uh, today's Wednesday, yesterday in class, I said, I'm gonna give this talk before class starts. Anybody, you know, you're in your fourth week of class, what have you learned so far? One of the students said, you know, I haven't learned this yet, but I never realized work I could be doing could be legal or illegal. And is there guidance that you can give us, you know, because I don't want to do something wrong, right? Um, which, which is kind of interesting because that's exactly what the course is supposed to be teaching you. Um, so, so let's talk about these knowledge units and, and I don't work for NIST, I just want to tell you, this is how I did the analysis of my course. And as I said, the first six are required in every work role. So there is a knowledge of laws, regulations, policy, and ethics as they relate to cybersecurity and privacy required for everything, right? These others are just ones I picked up. Like I said, there were, I can't remember the exact number I told you, but there's uh, 60 or 70 of these knowledge units. And so I'm going to go back to how I did this. I did this by a manual search. So I came up with a list of terms that an exhaustive list, I thought, one. Two, I recorded it on yellow pad paper, right? Because I couldn't find a better way to do it. And I wanted to be sure that my class was not only compliant with ABET and compliant with other standards, and we have another stand, uh, the designation here from the NSA. Um, but I wanted to be sure I was covering all this. Plus I wanted to be sure that when I had students in my class and I said, what do you wanna do? And they say, I wanna be a pen tester. Well, what do pen testers do? Well, you know, we do this and this. Okay, what's the legal implications of this? You know, people say, I wanna be a consultant and do pen testing. That sounds really exciting. Please set yourself up as an LLC or a private entity and be sure you have a contract. You know, da, 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 da. That's, that's going back to the basic law they should know but also the cybersecurity law that they should know. Um, and what is the risk in doing that job? So here's some of the questions that students don't understand, but think they do. So let me give you some examples that I teach. I teach, a, I teach from a textbook, <clears throat> but I don't start the textbook until the second week. My students are computer scientists, uh, engineers, I've had aerospace engineers, mechanical engineers, civil engineers. I've had people from the architecture department and our visualization. I get people from the Mays Business School here. I'm from the George Bush School of uh, Service and Public Policy. So a lot of them are not coders. And in fact, in our last faculty meeting, they were talking about, <clears throat> I'm sure as it is at Purdue, we're just, you know, we get so many applications and we have, you know, we're bursting the seams here trying to, uh, trying to keep everybody uh, happy. And uh, the graduate advisor said they have people coming in from different engineering, petroleum, mechanical, they want to get a master's in computer science. And he said, so I tell them to take Paula's classes because they don't have to know how to code and we'll catch them up on coding. And I was sitting like, yeah, is that a good thing or a bad thing? It's kind of like I was the you know, last resort. One of the biggest issues we have right now is jurisdiction. So let me use this analogy. If I walk out today and my car has been stolen, and I think, okay, what time did I get here this morning? How far could that car have gotten, let's say in six hours? It's highly unlikely someone's going to fly a plane and put my car on a plane, right? Uh, so it's so far away. They catch whoever stole my car. And without a doubt, Texas has jurisdiction. You know, unless they managed to get across the state line or they had a conspiracy where they're buying, you know, getting cars and doing this and that, Texas has jurisdiction because it's physical. The car is physical. And if I say, you know what, Louisiana law, there's different penalties for car thieves. And I don't know if this is true, but I'm just saying if. So I want this under Louisiana law. I was in Louisiana in August. Can't, you know, I like Louisiana. I like going to New Orleans, right? Can't you just do Louisiana law? The answer would be no. <clears throat> But here's the issue. Our laws were developed for a physical world, not a digital world. So if my data is stolen, who has jurisdiction, right? The internet doesn't understand geographic boundaries. You know, so my data is stolen and country, uh, out of country in country C, but along the way they steal it from me as a resident of Houston, Texas, 
and they use the resources of company of country B and C who has who has jurisdiction is one issue and maybe all three. The other notion of jurisdiction that is difficult for students to understand is with the, the rise of general data protection regulation, GDPR, that you can be just working away in Texas or wherever, and suddenly you are under the extraterritorial jurisdiction of GDPR if, in fact, you're processing data on citizens or residents of the EU under some restrictions where the processing is taking place. So jurisdiction is one of the biggest issues. Then just about the time students think they understand jurisdiction, we talk about standing and I love standing. Standing just means the right to bring a suit and we all have it under article three of the constitution. The problem with this, and I'll get to this in a minute on the graphic is um, standing is a federal, it's a constitutional right. It, our, our elements of standing actually came from a death penalty case in Arkansas in 1991 with our current laws about standing. But the concept of standing is interpreted differently depending on where you reside in the US. And let me tell you, this is where students just like, okay, stop, repeat that. How did this happen? Well, the supreme law in the United States is the Supreme Court. So unless it goes to the Supreme Court, you can have different appellate districts, and I'll show you a graphic in a minute, interpret it differently. And we have that currently. The Seventh Circuit in Chicago versus the uh, Third Circuit out of Delaware interprets the elements of standing differently. Now, listen to what I'm saying. They have to have the elements of standing. There's three elements. But they interpret them differently. And of course, then when I bring up the death penalty case, of standing in Arkansas, I always get this, but that has nothing to do with, you know, cybersecurity or data breaches or this or that. And that's another big difference between the technical mind and the legal mind. <clears throat> Technology does this, it just, you know, runs up exponentially. The law does this, do do, do do, do do, do do, and it always likes technology. <clears throat> and it base, is based on precedent. You got to find it in a court opinion. You got to find it in a statute. If I were giving a technical talk, and let's say I have invented a new way to stream music that requires no hardware, just I train your mind and, you know, whatever, something crazy. But I started that, that discussion talking about Edison inventing the phonograph, and then we went to, you know, 33 and the thirds and 45 RPMs and cassettes and eight tracks, and then we get the history of the iPods. And, You'd be like, why are we listening to this? What does this have to do with this? Tell us about the technology. But in law, we constantly go back to precedent. So a few years ago, there was a case in San Bernardino uh, where some uh, people were shot and, and killed at a uh, Christmas party. And there was a case because they were missing something like 18 minutes of these people's lives. And so they um, wanted to get Apple to de-encrypt the Apple phone. And they used a, a law of writs from like 1789 or something. And some of the commentators would write, well, this is really silly. They didn't have computers then, or they didn't do this, or they didn't do this. Or they didn't have encryption. How can they do this? That's because the biggest challenge to develop a legal analysis is to realize that the law is about process. It is about the process. That law, which is still good law because the Supreme Court of the United States has never invalidated that law, is about the process of gathering evidence. So we look at jurisdiction, the difference between laws written for the physical world, our constitution, most of our amendments, <clears throat> the Bill of Rights, all 1789, you know, uh, our notion of standing, that's that's not even the word standing is never in the constitution, but has been interpreted. The fact that you could have a death penalty case, the structure of American courts where you have your fact-finding court at the state and federal level, the only way you get to the appellate court in your state or federal is a mistaken law. People don't understand this either. Your, your lowest courts, the fact-finding court by either judge or jury, your middle court is your fact-finding, uh, excuse me, is your, has to have a mistaken law and it has to be in the written record. So again, forget what you watch on TV where somebody objects and the, the judge overrules it and they all sit down. No, 
<clears throat> they're going to get it in writing while it was overruled. Because that's the only thing you can get to that appellate level. Did the jury get the wrong instructions? Were people excluded from the jury that shouldn't have been excluded? Did the judge let in evidence he shouldn't have or uh, not let in evidence he should have? Whatever. It has to be a mistake in law. And then in every state and the federal, we have the Supreme Courts. Texas is really interesting. Texas is just a strange place. You know, we like to think we're there in a whole other country. We actually have two Supreme Courts. One of them is called, get this, the Supreme Court, all right? We have district courts, we have the appellate courts, there's 14 of them in Texas, depending on where you live. Then we have two Supreme Courts. One is called the Supreme Court, and let's listen to civil cases, and the other is the Court of Criminal Appeals, which is the Supreme Court for criminal. So people outside of Texas will hear a Court of Criminal Appeals and think it's at the second level, it's like, no, it's at the third level, <laughs> you know? It's Texas, what can I say? We also have something called the Texas Railroad Commission that regulates oil and gas. We don't do the old, remember the old computer stuff, call by name, call by value? Yeah, we don't do the call by name very well. Another thing we talk about is the standards of evidence. You know, that you have a civil more likely than not, <clears throat> you have a clear and convincing, and then you have beyond a reasonable doubt for criminal and when they come into effect. So my first week, this is what I'm talking about. Uh, we talk about separation of power, the executive, the legislative, and the uh, uh, judicial. And we tend to think our laws come just from the Congress or our legislature in our state. Well, you know, we have these court opinions, you know, the Supreme Court, Brown v. Board of Education, Roe v. Wade, Lawrence v. Texas, okay. But they don't also realize <clears throat> that an executive order from the president directing only executive agencies, which is everything other than the court's and Congress under his power have the full effect of law. And so one of the things I do rigorously is first of all, I teach people how to read a law. I'll be doing that third tomorrow on the CFAA Computer Fraud and Abuse Act because if you're ever gonna go to prison as an individual, that's a, that's a very likely one. And I show them how you read it. And it's not like you read a Stephen King novel where you start at the beginning then you read the end. You go through and you figure out the outline of the law. You look at the definitions of the law look at the causes under the CFAA, for example, we have seven. You look at the fact that there's two lines in that law that talks about conspiracy and you think two lines, what can that mean in that long law? And then you find out that's a very powerful two, law, two lines. Then the criminal penalties, right? So I teach them how to read the law. The other thing I teach them is how to read an executive order from the president. I think we have this notion that uh, our president you know, gets up in the morning and picks up a form that says executive order and says, oh, what do I feel like doing today? How about an executive order that everybody has to wear pink hats on Tuesday? Yay, right? But it turns out the executive order has a certain form and format. And the first thing the president does is call on his powers under the constitution. And then depending on different things, he, can, he or she, if, if we have a female president, can ever only direct federal agencies under his con her, her control. And then at the end, there's always this disclaimer that this creates no right and privilege for anybody but the federal government. So in other words, you can't use an executive order to create your own right of action. Very powerful. And that the only reason you can ever void an executive order and they go directly to the Supreme Court is if they violate the Constitution. Otherwise, they can be totally unreasonable, but unless they violate the Constitution, um, which is also something I don't have listed here per se, but you teach people that the only question the Supreme Court of the United States ever ask is this action Constitution. That's it. That's it. And they are truly the Supreme Court of the United States because they don't have to follow the rules of the appellate courts. They can do de novo, you know, start and look at everything. They can decide what they want to do. They can decide what cases they want to hear, whatever. So these are just some of the, the, the topics I cover. <clears throat> I talk a lot about the amendments. We, you know, everybody loves, like I always say, everybody loves the First Amendment until you don't, right? <laughs> until it's used against you. But there's five aspects, the establishment of religion. I just read today that they're coming after Texas. The Department of Justice is coming after Texas because our governor has said you can't mandate mask. And they're saying that basically establishes a you know religious type thing. And I'm like, I don't understand that point, but you know, good luck with that one. 
uh, that how powerful our First Amendment protections are, but everybody gets a queasy feeling in their safe stomach when you find out that the Supreme Court in 1969 ruled that the Klan could build a, burn a cross on a hill near Cincinnati, unless there was an imminent threat of danger that's protected speech. Spoiler alert, it's not in other countries. Uh, England really uh, recently lost a lot of soccer games in the Euro Cup, and there were some players who were um, from uh, minorities and they were called out on social media by individuals. In the United States, we can't do anything about that. In the UK, they were arrested because they didn't threaten. There was no imminent threat. There was just ugly pejorative racist comments made and under UK law, they don't have first amendment protections. You know, we talk about fourth amendment compliance search warrants. What does that mean in the digital age? What does that mean probable cause? What can I search? If it says, you know, person's houses, effects written in 1789, what does that mean? And, and what are the cases that are that are edging this out, which an important case was Carpenter, um, the Carpenter case in June of 2018, which said, we've had this third party precedent since the 50s. We're not undoing it. But this guy, he was tracked criminally by geolocation data on his phone. They should have gotten a search warrant in this case because these guys, our mobile phones have become such a part of who we are. We carry so much of our personal life. Although the Supreme Court said narrow opinion, okay? Talk about the Fifth Amendment against self-incrimination and the like. And the biggest ones are we don't, we, I teach that we have definitions that are legal and we have definitions that are technical. And in the law, guess what trumps? If there's a legal definition, it trumps a technical definition. If there's no legal definition, it goes to the common ordinary definition of the word. My patent is in drilling fluids. Drilling fluids are called mud. If I wrote the patent and used the word mud and didn't define it as meaning drilling fluids, the patent would have been interpreted as, you know, dirt and water mixed together. That's through all law. So, a big thing that I try to do is, like I said, build in the analysis to help students know what is legal or not legal. So let me show you this. First of all, anytime you see this right here, USC, United States Code, that's federal law. So here's the definition of computer under the CFAA. This was written in the 1980s. I don't think, if I said at the beginning of this talk, write your definition of computers, that you would ever have come up with this definition. It seems a little archaic, especially what it says, we're not talking about an automated typewriter, typesetter, portable handheld calculator. I, I, I'm scared to ask who's never seen a typewriter or something, right? But this is our legal definition. And this definition, because it is in the CFAA, Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, but it has been used in other cases to say, is a cell phone a computer? And the answer was, well, does it do this and this and this? Can I do this and this and this? Yep, yeah, cell phone, it's a computer. It was used in a case where a man enticed a young girl over state lines uh, by sending her text before we had laws in place to prevent that. And said, yeah, it's a computer. So it comes under this law, which was not the intent of the law to catch like, you know, kind of either creepy people or almost pedophiles, but it was interpreted as such. It was used to determine that two gentlemen in uh, New Jersey, I think, who figured out a, a bug in poker machines, that it wasn't a computer because it failed this test. It wasn't a you know, CFAA, they tried him under CFAA, they tried to get him on other things. It was like dumber, dumber. These guys figured out a bug in the poker machine. If you didn't run a certain sequence, it paid out as if you last one, last 10. You know, most of people would have taken it for millions. They, they walked away with like 400,000. Another big area, and especially to my international students, is understanding that we have no unified body of law. We are a, a confederation of states. We are, you know, 50 states that got together. Most countries, Britain, Canada, India, whatever, they also have states or provinces, but they have unified federal law. We don't. We don't. So I always kid my uh, students that if you're going to do a crime, stop and look up at the crime because it might be benefit you to cross a state line. There's cases of uh, sexting and cyberbullying. We still have a couple of states that don't have laws against it. In some states, we have draconian laws 
uh, Washington state being one very strict law a felony in other states which requires a person uh, to re, uh, register as a sex offender for the rest of their life and other states are misdemeanors. It doesn't make, you know, it's, it's inconsistent, right? And then at the same time, we look at these states such as Texas and we have 14 appellate districts. So I live in Houston, which got split into two and they might interpret state law differently than the 10th district that's out of Waco. And unless it goes to the Texas Supreme Court, if it's civil or the Texas Court of Criminal Appeals, if it's criminal, it's the way it works, right? So I talked about standing and I just I just put this in here. I'm watching my time. Let's see. Sorry. I have my little timer running and my phone security decided it didn't want to show me the clock anymore. Um, <clears throat> but uh, the standing and I, and I always love the part that this was a death penalty case. I mean, that's that's really interesting. They I won't go into it unless we've got time of questions and answers, but it's one of those weird things that only happens in the United States, right? This, what I put in red, is interpreted differently by the Seventh uh, Circuit Court, which is the appellate court for the federal courts in Chicago, than the a court in um, the Third Court of Appeals in, uh, that includes Delaware. So if you are in a data breach in a state with the Seventh Court of Appeals, they interpret the injury part, the component in red, as being just the risk of harm happening. So my data is breached. I can't prove anybody really stole money, but they say the risk of that constitutes injury. Now listen to what I'm saying. They have to have an injury in fact, but they interpret that very liberally, as opposed to the third circuit, which includes Delaware, which many of our corporations are headquartered, who say, no, unless you have real harm, you fail standing. And the biggest reason you don't have more success in data breaches and these kind of things is it fails the standing prong in that injury in fact. So those are the legal things. Now we got to look at the technology things we're looking at. Hacking back is a big one. And I know Purdue's done a lot on this. I quote Spaff from his talk here in December, I think it was 2015 sometimes. Um, <clears throat> you know, hacking back, uh, President Trump put through an executive order in September 2018 called, we didn't call it hacking back. Uh, we called it forward defense, which was a euphemism because forward defense meant let's not wait to get hacked. We'll just attack you as a national strategy if we think, we think you're going to attack us, right? Um, <clears throat> we don't know where the status of that executive order is. When I look for it, it's taken off the White House website. However, I haven't found one that's been retracted, which means it's still in effect. So I don't know. Then we tell people to do privacy by design. Well, you know, when I look at privacy in that NIST NICE framework, that word shows up so many places, so many times. How do I know what that means? Or security by design. You know, these are like uh, a, a tenet of GDPR is you have privacy by design. Well, what does that mean to me legally? It's a technical term, but how do I <clears throat> make sure I'm doing that legally? Another one is data ownership. Under GDPR, you own the data, the data subject. In the US, I think it's the corporations that own the data. Yeah, they've got data on me and I've got limited rights. Some of my other student concerns have been dangers of things like bug bounties or dangers of pen testing. You know, there was a case in Kansas and Missouri where the guys did pen testing and ended up spending a weekend in jail because somebody forgot to tell somebody and, you know, they hacked into the system. And, and the biggest thing is in red is what my students say, how do we know what is legal or not? Because of all the concepts I've talked about, jurisdiction, standing, you know, what, where are you? What state are you in? Or what part of the country are you in if it's federal law? And then people who will say to me, well, that's not ethical. Well, here's the problem with that. Law and ethics aren't really the same thing. Sadly, the Nazis wrote everything in law, but no one could possibly argue that what they did was less than evil, unethical, immoral, right? Uh, some of the things that are in law, we, you know, we have that gut reaction that eh, this doesn't pass my ethics test. So we, we talk about ethics and the law, but they're not synonymous. Then we have the big one, the difference between engineering and legal mindsets. And that is this, engineers, computer scientists, whatever, we like to solve problems. Give me a problem and let me solve it. 
And a lot of times, like in algorithms or something, there's only one solution. Is this a P, you know, is this a non-polynomial time, polynomial time, da, 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 and not the algorithm, I'm sorry, the problem that would be classified like that. Legal mind sets that, well, it depends. Oh, you know, this argument this week's stronger for that argument, for that uh, problem being solved, polynomial time. But last week it was this, you know, and somebody would look at me and say, you're a computer science professor. You know what, were you, you know, how'd you get through that? Our engineering mindsets are to solve the problem. Our legal mindsets, it's difficult to solve the problem because we have so much unknown. And because like I said, technology moves like this and the law is always lagging behind. And we are in trying to interpret laws written for the physical world in the digital and virtual world. And that's not gonna change. I'm working on a project now to look at the uh, law and ethics of using drones and robots in uh, response to COVID with another professor here, Dr. Robin Murphy. And we have this concept sometimes, she's looking at the ethical concerns and I'm like, yeah, but you know, there's nothing against the law that they couldn't use that for surveillance, right? Or there's, well, what if this and this? Yeah, but the law doesn't have, the law hasn't caught up to that yet. So here's my classification I told you earlier. If you're gonna get in trouble and I hope you're not, so I always tell my students, I really don't wanna see you in the news. It's gonna be under the laws in red. Computer Fraud and Abuse Act and the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. And I spend a lot of time going through these laws. The one in green is if you're gonna be working for a company and something happens and the company is at risk, such as, and this isn't an exhaustive list, GDPR in the California, GDPR light of the consumer, uh, the CCPA. The ones in blue are laws that I talk about in class, but they actually restrict the government. They're not to be confused with our constitutional protections. They're actually stronger in some sense than what we might have in constitutional protections, but there's nothing preventing Congress. So this is where the government can or cannot get to your stored communications, to your metadata about that, to listening in. You know, They use the word wiretap. And again, people think wiretap is some physical thing and no, that's not it in the legal sense. Wiretap is any interception of communication. Remember what I said, legal terms trump. By the way, I uh, like to do an exercise in the beginning of class and I give them some typical cybersecurity terms since there's confidentiality, integrity, availability, computer, privacy. And I ask the class, what have legal definitions? And they're always surprised when I show them that the terms confidentiality, integrity, and availability are defined in federal statute, the US Patriot Act. Computer, I've shown you from CFAA, and then we always have this discussion that we have no general statutory definition for privacy. We have laws to protect your student records, FERPA, your medical records, HIPAA, banking records, uh, Graham Leach Bliley, but no one can define for me what privacy is. We have no general definition. And, uh, you know, engineers and computer scientists, they like to see things in black and white. And you know, they don't like this. Well, let me think about this. Um, so let me close with kind of talking about how I teach. I do standard lectures on old school, kind of you know following my Purdue model here. We do do some discussions. I, it's not as easy to do because people either Google the law. You know, I had somebody one time start arguing with me, and I finally said, "Where are you getting this?" And they said, "Well, right here." And it was like that one that website's not valid. That's somebody's opinion. And other people say, well, in, in Texas, this and this and this, and where are you getting that? Well, I Googled it. Well, no, in California, non-competes are illegal. In Texas, competes are illegal, you know, in California, whatever. You got to be careful. So discussions, sometimes you really have to watch or people get emotional in them. Um, I've set myself up one time and ask about important Supreme Court decisions. And the guy brought up the one about uh, gay marriage and being in Texas, we have a very conservative thing. And I thought, oh no, I've opened the door, but, uh, but you know, why he thought it shouldn't be constitutional and why other people thought it could be constitutional and like. This semester I've added something where every week I do a short discussion on book recommendations. Uh, tell, this is how they tell me the world ends about cybersecurity. The Great Dissenter is an awesome book. Um, Everyone knows about Brown v. Board of Education in the early 50s that ended the separate but equal. But what people don't know is the separate but equal was a Supreme Court doctrine in Plessy v. Ferguson in 1898, I believe. There was one lone dissenter. The majority of the court went for separate but equal. And let's not fool ourselves. We all knew it wasn't separate but equal. 
The one dissenter was a former slave owner who had a half brother that not quite sure who the father was, but the mother was undoubtedly a slave. But uh, John Marshall Harlan's father raised the biracial man as his son, even though he couldn't have the son educated. And the son actually became a millionaire and all this kind of stuff. So you have this unique American perspective that the lone dissenter, again, separate but equal, was a former slave owner who fought for the union, who became an advocate for rights, who came from this convoluted family background. And the most important thing I tell my students is his dissent became the basis for Thurgood Marshall's argument before the Supreme Court and Brown v. Board of Education. To me, that's just fascinating. And people, I think we look at Supreme Court decisions at a point in time and we don't realize the history. The other, if you ever just want to read one book on American law, read Gideon's Trumpet. And then you see we, we have a great system. Don't have time to talk about it, but it was. I teach from this textbook. <clears throat> I teach a little bit out of the Talon Manual, the first three chapters, due diligence, jurisdiction. So I go through it, but it's not international law. Most of it is not. And it only applies, it was a, a NATO uh, document. So if you're not in NATO, you don't care about it anyway. Uh, I, optional text, I do a lecture on and cover, you'll see this message when it's too late, where she classifies a lot of these breaches, goes through the policy. Jeff Kossip's a favorite of mine, 26 words that created the internet. Um, I mentioned this, tell me the world ends. I do, this is a very writing intensive class, no coding. Uh, it's written assignments. It's it's take home exams. Uh, I have to be very crafty to create questions that you know, so it eliminates uh, or someone who works with other people are going to be, you know, show up. I tell them they can use any source. They can Google. They can use documents. They can use class notes, except a human being. And then they do a semester paper. And I have to tell you, the semester papers I get are just really awesome. So I'll close with this. This was a comment that was passed back to me. Um, uh, from someone who took the class last spring and, and would go home and tell everybody that lived with him what the class was like. And I have like three students this semester that this student uh, uh, got to take the class. So I think that's probably the 50 minutes. I've probably left out some in my notes, but uh, let's look at the questions. So is it hard to go from a PhD to JD? Did you have to start over? Here's what you do. I went to law school in my early 50s. By that time, I had raised kids as a single mom. I had survived cancer. I had been the up and downs. I went in with a different attitude than you'd probably go in if you were you know, 22 or 23. I went in with the attitude that if I don't like this, I'm gonna quit and do something else. But I knew I was unhappy doing what I was doing in Austin and I had hit age discrimination, which I always say is not a glass ceiling, it's solid titanium. At that time, me and Michael Dell seemed to be the only people in our age group still working and you know, he was doing real well. Do you see a national standard for privacy and what is the alternative? Unfortunately, I don't. I don't. And if we had more time to talk about this, our notion of privacy, if you think you're a graduate student and you can't affect the world, our notion of privacy started with a large journal article written by Louis Brandeis and Samuel Warren in the 1890s. I always forget the exact year while they were in law school. Best definition of privacy I know. To be let alone. And as you all know, Louis Brandeis and later became a Supreme Court justice who authored and used this philosophy in many of our privacy. Um, what people miss is privacy, Supreme Court decisions on privacy are Roe v. Wade. It's about privacy. It's not about abortion. Lawrence v. Texas, it's about who you're allowed to have sexual relationship with. Uh, I always forget the name of the case in Connecticut that predated these. That was the right for married couple to buy birth control in, in uh, Maryland. I always forget that. It's, it's not Cotwell, but it's something it's else. Right. Griswold, thank you. It's the Griswolds. I just have to remember the National Lampoon Christmas thing, right? Um, thank you. <clears throat> so our, our whole notion of cybersecurity, I'm mean, sorry, our own notion of privacy from the Supreme Court are about personal behavior. And this is something Justice Breyer wrote about recently and said, does anybody realize it's all about who you can have sex with and what you can do this and this, and this is our notion of privacy? You know, hello. Um, <clears throat> Legal challenges with election and cyber integrity. That's a whole, that, that's if you want to hang out after that, yeah. Um, so is this one the SCOTUS? 
uh, oh, New Jersey in, in 2021. SCOTUS, by the way, just recently had a case against a Georgia policeman who took, who exceeded his authorization under CFAA, was charged under CFAA. And it's the first time I've seen a long time that the court said, we're back in CFAA down. Now, and they let the guy, now the guy was tried on other charges, but they didn't take it as a CFAA, although I personally saw it as a clear CFA, um, you know, violation. So we're looking to the court now to say, okay, what's going to happen? Uh, you know, there are so many, so much stuff you can find good stuff on the internet. I follow Jeff Kossif who's at the Naval Academy. I follow Scott Shackelford, who's at Indiana University. I can't remember the name of his institute, but I've got one of his books right here, or probably two of his books. Um, there's a lot that if you follow online, that people who have computer science backgrounds and are lawyers and are working and teaching and researching this. So that's two you can follow, Jeff Kossig and Scott Shackelford. Um, and let me look at the time. We got about three minutes. So to go back to Mark Fisher's question, the Supreme Court, there's no clear, when they declined to hear a case, remember the map I showed you of the different appellate districts here? When they de declined to hear a case, we have a split in the circuits because some of, the, some of the circuits will say, you have to disclose your password and other circuits will say no. And this is one of the things that confuses my students like, how can you have federal law interpreted differently in different circuits, different geographic locations? Well, that's kind of the way it is. I didn't make the system, but we all live under it. So when you comment on that, they're the Supreme Court. They don't have to give us a reason. You disclosed your iPhone passwords, then they let the lower court's ruling stand. And uh, New Jersey, I think that's in the Third Circuit. You'll find that. Um, whole different philosophy than let's say the Ninth Circuit. Courts try not to be political. We know they are. And if you look at some of the decisions that come out of the Ninth Circuit, which is in San Francisco, they are very technology friendly because where do they live? Where do you get those judges? What is their experience, right? I don't think they wake up every morning and say, I'm going to be political. I think they're affected by the culture, just like I live in Texas, and it's a very conservative state. You know, um, uh, it's a very conservative state. So you, you can't help but, you know, if you don't like it, you have to deal with it. And if you like it, you say, Yahoo, you know, <laughs> this is great, right? Uh, but we're affected by where we are and our history. Other questions? A bunch on the chat I'm missing. And I think uh, I asked people to move their conversations over to uh, the chat. To the Q and A, yes. Oh, okay. I think I've got all the Q and A. So Scott talked. I've never met Scott Shackelford, but I really like him. If anybody knows somebody different than Jeff Kossif and uh, Scott Shackelford, I'm trying to write a book on cybersecurity risk <clears throat> because I can't find a good one. I would never try to write a book on cybersecurity law because those two guys, they got it down. You know, I would never be able to compete. There, um, there is a, an ACM group on cyber and, and the law. Oh, yeah. Um, but um, there's not a lot public, but they do issue um, opinions and statements on occasion and weigh in on, um, through them, I've, I've actually filed the, uh, uh, several amica uh, briefs with uh, actually with the Supreme Court. So um, oh, cool. There is some action there. Um, there is that and there's the Electronic Freedom Foundation, which I also follow, but I have to tell my students, remember these are non-binding. These are, you know, you can follow the amicus briefs and everything and, you know, EFF might have some great ideas, but they have no legal authority. They try to uh, be persuasive. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Several, several groups like that. Um, and, and I also mentioned there for anybody who's a Purdue student, in the spring, we have a course, uh, CS 523, which is on ethics, the law and economics. We don't cover as much as uh, Professor DeWitt does, 
in about the legal system, but a lot of it is covered. Uh, so if you're interested, that's available as a possibility. I, I think at this point, we've sort of hit the end of our time here. And thank you so much, Paula, for presenting with, uh, with all of us here. No, oh, it's been uh, my pleasure. It's been my pleasure. I've enjoyed really appreciate this. It. And we're going to have to get you back in person at some point uh, for a longer conversation. And, and I ought to talk to you separately about, uh, about some of what I teach in that course. And maybe we can uh, collaborate some. I would love to. I would so, love to. So thank you and have a wonderful afternoon, everyone. And uh, we will have another one of these seminars a week from today. So we'll meet you all then. Okay, thank you all and stay safe.